Thank you, Margaret. As uh, I mentioned earlier, my name is Dan Serp. I'm with the Clinton County Board of Supervisors. I've uh, been in office for a little over a year now, and when I came into this process, it was already very well underway. As, as was mentioned, um, the needs had been identified really and, and specifically narrowed down back in 2000 and 2000, 2008, 2007 and 2008. Um, as with any problem, identifying that you have a problem and accepting that you have a problem is kind of the first step in dealing with the problem. So once we got past that or part of the process, we retained Shive Hattery to do a needs assessment, needs assessment of our facility for our county and to identify what type of a structure and facility we need to construct to meet our needs for the long-term uh, purposes of the county. Uh, once we've got that identified, <clears throat> then we worked on a site selection process. We engaged the public and requested uh, people to submit potential sites that they thought would be viable options for the county to consider. We had an active public panel of, of citizens from throughout the county involved in narrowing that list of 26 potential sites down to uh, just four, and then we asked our engineer to look at those four sites and identify uh, the strengths and weaknesses of each of those sites and why we would choose one over another. Ultimately, to construct our facility adjacent to our existing jail and to connect it to the courthouse, excuse me, <coughs> got a tickle going there, but to connect it to our, our courthouse is important because of the reduced cost of transporting prisoners. Even just transporting prisoners from a couple blocks away to their court appearances adds a tremendous cost to the life cycle. And so we have planned to have a designated hallway to be able to move prisoners from the jail directly into the courtrooms, and that does increase our safety and security substantially over our current system, which is to walk them across the parking lot. Uh, walking them across the parking lot is something that has consistently been mentioned in our jail reports as inappropriate because there's a tremendous amount of liability not only to the prisoners and to the correctional officers but also to the public because there's an exposure and a risk there. And so we, we've uh, chosen to proceed with connecting to the courthouse. So then we began our, <clears throat> began our design phase and there again we, we requested uh, assistance and participation from the public. Specifically, we, we asked the Historic Preservation and County Historical Society to be involved with this conversation, and that's because our courthouse is on the National Historic Register. Uh, we have a beautiful courthouse that many throughout the state regard as the very nicest courthouse in the state, so we want to be very respectful of that. Uh, for example, when we had the Mississippi Bell Cruises come through here last summer, uh, the courthouse was one of their main stops that they came and they wanted to tour because it's such a, a beautiful facility. So um, in the process, we've tried to identify and build a facility that was very respectful in nature to that courthouse and allow that courthouse to still be the highlight. But we've also worked very diligently to have it be an efficiently run facility that will be able to operate at low cost. Uh, and, and try to alleviate the cost of construction as much as we could wherever we could and also be able to meet our needs for the long term. Now we're in the, the public education. We appreciate you coming and joining us and uh, viewing the presentation. Ultimately, we're working towards a May 3rd referendum. That referendum will have to, <coughs> have to pass at a 60% uh, approval rating by the public that shows up to vote on that day. And so with a successful uh, vote, then we would be moving into construction phase. The construction phase would likely begin in March of 2017. That's because there is additional design work that needs to be completed. The design that we've done to this point was really to the amount where we wanted to be able to demonstrate to our public what our intentions are and what we're proposing to be built and also to be able to identify an appropriate cost to assign to the project. But we didn't want to design at this point down to the weight bearing walls and every square inch because we didn't want to spend the money not knowing if the referendum would pass. And so we're trying all the way through this process to be very mindful of what the tax dollars are and the implication to our taxpayers. The projected cost is $21.8 million. And when we received that from our architect architecture firm, we did uh, retain a second opinion from a construction manager who has a tremendous amount of experience in this industry constructing these type of facilities. We wanted to make sure there again that the cost that we're putting on our bond referendum was going to be able to meet our needs and avoid overages and, and extra added expenses. And so they assured us that they were comfortable with us running at that price. And so that's where we're moving forward. 
you may have noticed that our referendum is actually being run at $22 million. That's because there is a cost to the county to secure that bonding. We have to hire legal professionals and financial advisors, and so the process of securing a $21.8 million bond will cost the county about $200,000. So we're running the bond at $22 million. We have broken that down into what we estimate the cost implications will be to the residents. Um, the, the way that we addressed doing that was to uh, say that if you have a $100,000 value of residential property, we have a first year, an average, and a final year uh, estimated cost on the property taxes. That average is just under $35 per year. And then we've also done that calculation pertaining to uh, agricultural land because we do have a substantial amount of agricultural land throughout the county. <laughs> to break that equation down, we asked our auditor for a little bit of help. The state has a 56% rollback in place for a residential property. So if you take that $100,000 <laughs> residential valued property, apply the rollback, then the debt service calculation would be the 69 cent levy that would be multiplied by that or assessed taxable value. And that gives us that first year impact of $38. The final year impact would be projected at $31 and that average of just under 35. Uh, bonds are front loaded. They try to get you know their, their uh, interest expenses on the front end and so it does decrease over time. And it's on the website. Yep, and this information's on the website of course. This is a slide that, uh, a presentation to the Farm Bureau of Clinton County. Uh, they asked us to uh, include information and a comparison of what the cost is to replace our facility versus what the cost is to operate with the projected closure in mind. And so the replacement facility on this graph is the blue line. And you see out at year 20 that the debt service drops off because the, the facility would be paid for. The red line is the projection of what it would cost us to move forward without having our own facility open. That is anticipating a major infrastructure failure, increased liability costs, or having the state inspector close our facility. <clears throat> but we do believe that those are all viable options to occur. And so it's appropriate for us to analyze uh, moving forward without a jail, just due to the nature of the challenges that we are currently experiencing. And so the projection is that it would be substantially less expensive to replace our facility than to move forward without. Um, another facet of this is that if we're moving forward without a facility, then we're sending over the first 20 years $50 million out of county to other counties and to support other counties' staffs and other counties' economies. And so we do feel that there's an additional benefit of constructing and staffing our own facility that we are retaining those dollars here in our communities. There are some additional uh, financial considerations that we think merit discussion from the county's point of view. Uh, the county currently has three outstanding debts in place in the form of bonds. Two of them relate to road construction and maintenance, and those will be retired and paid off and removed from the levy in 2019 and 2020, respectively. Uh, we do not anticipate needing to replace those debt service levies because the state has now put into place a 10 cent gas sales tax to support maintaining and constructing of infrastructure. And so where we've been uh, required or felt obligated to bond for that maintenance, historically we, don't not, we do not anticipate needing to in the future. The third levy is in place was a, a loan to the city of Clinton from the county for the purposes of constructing a rail spur in the railport development, which is our industrial development on the west side of town. And that debt service for that rail spur of $6 million will be paid off in the year 2020 also. And so when those three debts are paid off, that will remove $33.60 from our debt service levy, which nearly offsets the average cost annually to the, the payment for the jail. Another component is that loan to the city of Clinton is scheduled to be repaid in the year 2020. And that repayment is tied to the city of Clinton's ability to sell land for development in that rail port. As that land is sold, 50% of that uh, sale price comes back to the county for repayment of that loan. As we receive that money back from uh, the city of Clinton, the county is very limited in how we can spend that money. It can only be used for debt service 
on capital improvement projects. And so when we've done analysis of the needs of the county, really the, the jail and, and sheriff's office and communications department are the last of our needs. We've remodeled the uh, courthouse into, inside and out. Uh, the, the satellite office in DeWitt that's new construction is entirely paid for. And so when we're looking around, we don't have other places that we feel like we can spend something in the neighborhood of $6 million. And so what that would do was put us in a position to further reduce the cost of that annual levy on our residents and property owners. And so it's very likely that after the year 2020, as we receive that money back from the city of Clinton, the county would be able to put the tax levy lower than what it actually currently is today. So then this is another slide that came as direct feedback from an early presentation was why would we not wait till 2020 if everything gets so good after 2020, why not wait? And so we asked our construction professionals about that and they said, well, the biggest reason is, is that every year we delay, costs go up. Cost of materials go up, cost of labor go up, cost of uh, the construction itself, site preparation, all the above. And so uh, the four to four and a half percent number was gathered out of the Quad City region. It's our nearest metropolitan area that they gather that type of data for. Um, and that number is, is applied for this area as well because of our proximity. And then as we've reviewed our prices, our construction manager actually advised us that it's likely over 5% for this area now. And so this $850,000 per year of delay cost was calculated based on that 4%. If uh, we're actually above 5% now, then we'd be looking at over a million dollars annual additional cost to the project that we, for, for each year that we delay in beginning the construction. So, uh, you know, this process has, has been long and thorough and very in-depth. We've worked very hard to have it be transparent and open to the public. It's been well documented by our media partners. And we've had literally all of the information that's been given consideration along the way available for our public to review on our website. We encourage you to do so. Um, if you have their handout, I believe the website is listed there, but it's also as easy as just Google in Clinton County, Iowa to find that website. I think it's the first first one that pops up. So uh, please join our website or you know, visit our website and review that information. Some of the other things that you'll see is a virtual tour and also uh, tour schedules, the frequently asked questions. Uh, we've got a tremendous amount of support information available there. Another resource that we've made available to our public is uh, to take personal tours of our jail, sheriff's office, and communication facility so people can go and put eyes on, hands on, uh, experience with the ability to form their opinion about replacing that facility. Uh, we, we are offering those tours roughly three days a week. We've been scheduling and, and posting those in the media and on the newspapers with the radio and also on the website. And so if you'd be interested in joining us for a tour and like to come see our facility, please contact <coughs> us at, at the website or uh, by giving us a phone call and scheduling a time to come join us. Thank you, Margaret. Um, in addition to having all the information on the website, we also had a request to make hard copies available at the public libraries throughout the county. So if you're a person that prefers not to uh, read on the internet or maybe doesn't you know, utilize the internet to uh, get your information, there are displays with uh, binders full of information at all of the public libraries throughout the county. So that's another resource that's available for you. I'd like to take a few moments and, and go through a few slides of, of our conceptual plan. And so we'll start with the exterior. If you've been to our courthouse recently, you know that we have a security president presence at the main entrance where we have a metal detector and some security guards posted. Uh, that would be moved to a new common entrance for the whole compound uh, right inside the main entrance. And once you process through security, then you would uh, go left to the courthouse or go right to the sheriff's offices. Uh, some of the, the services that the sheriff's offices provide would be uh, gun permits, accident reports, um, uh, civil services, sex offender registry, sex offender registry. and so there's there's a lot of uh, traffic. Yeah, thank you. There's a lot of traffic to the sheriff's office by the public for uh, different documentation and, and needs as well as, as to the courthouse. So having a single security presence does, does maintain our efficiency. It doesn't have to require any additional personnel to have a secure facility, but it does uh, you know, keep those services available. 
We've worked very strongly with our architect, as I mentioned, to be respectful of the courthouse. Uh, some of the features that you'll see incorporated are direct tributes to the architecture of our courthouse, the two-toning of the building, for example, or uh, the, some of the overhangs above the entrances and things like that are features that you'll be able to identify in our courthouse and it helps the eye be able to um, look at the facility as, as like it was almost planned to be that way all along, even though it was, it was constructed many, many, many decades um, apart. And so there again, we're working to, to have a very attractive facility. Um, we're trying to do that at, at a, you know, appropriate cost expense. We're using materials that are efficient, but low cost to install. And, uh, you know, some, some courthouses and jails are located with great distance between them. Uh, Cedar County, for instance, has essentially a, a very nice pole barn for their jail. We just don't feel that like constructing that type of facility next to our courthouse is appropriate. This is a floor plan of the first floor. Uh, I believe this was the seventh revision that we've undergone. The gray area on the left side of the screen here represents the footprint of the courthouse. Uh, we've had some people that you know identify that that footprint is much smaller than our new construction, but we, we try to remind people that we have a four-story courthouse, and this is mostly single-story construction. And so single-story construction is much more efficient, cost-effective than build, building a multi-story complex. And so um, please keep in mind that the, the square footage of the two facilities isn't that far apart. The sheriff referenced his little plastic piece that holds the, the lid out of the pizza where the correction officer will be located. That, that's the control unit in the center of the jail. And then the green areas around would be the pods. Uh, the largest of each is kind of a daytime area and then individual cells around the perimeter. And all with that direct line of sight from the, the correctional officer located in the center of the room. As I mentioned, the sheriff's offices will be located here in the tan area. The courthouse is in the gray. Uh, these two yellow spaces here are the classroom spaces that we identified, which uh, not only would help us get people connected with services for mental health, substance abuse, uh, starting their GEDs, but also uh, a lot of counties offer religious services, writing classes, and a lot of other resources that are all data-driven data to uh, reduce the number of repeat customers in our jail. Ultimately. We're trying to keep people out of jail, and there's data that shows that having these resources available assists in that process. The kind of dark brown, orange area here around the top would be our intake and processing area. The, the very topmost of the screen, which is actually the south along 6th Avenue there, uh, that's the sally port where an arresting officer would be able to pull his squad, squad car into uh, contained environment, close the doors, and then load that arrested individual in a safe and secure area and lead them into the processing area. And then we have our, our processing room where we have space for everything from evidence, fingerprinting, DUI, uh, testing. Uh, I'd have to defer to the sheriff, I'm not the jail professional, but um, really a space that's meant to design, designed to meet our needs for the long term and based on what the state codes and the requirements are for our construction. Um, the light blue area in the center is a, an additional feature we don't currently have besides the classroom space and that's a medical area. Uh, right now we administer medications and do any medical work in the same area that we're fingerprinting and doing those DUI testings and those processing and that's something the state inspector has consistently said is inappropriate. And, and so that's something we need to address. Um, another thing that that does for us is it gives us a, a contained cell, uh, three contained cells, where if we have a person with a communicable disease, we're able to isolate them from the rest of the jail population. Uh, I think it's been about three months ago, we had an individual that had MRSA. And in our jail, when we have someone that has that type of problem, that means they take up eight cells all by themselves. Um, and so having a single isolated cell that's that's contained to be able to deal with individuals that have those types of problems um, is an appropriate consideration. The, the bulk of the remaining side of the facility is laundry and kitchen and uh, storage, and then the bottom component is for the maintenance department. <coughs> As I mentioned, just a, a small portion of our building is, is a two-story construction, and that's above the sheriff's offices. And so uh, that area would house our communications department and also our emergency management team. 
Emergency management is the team that activates when we have a tornado or a nuclear event or a lost child or somebody that's fallen into the river or any type of rescue events. And they coordinate uh, multi-agency responses to significant emergencies. And so having them located in proximity to the communications department and to the sheriff's department is appropriate and, and really necessary. And so right now, <coughs> They're located in the courthouse, and we would be looking at uh, giving them an office space in the new construction. <clears throat> this is the exterior model of, of what we anticipate the grounds would look like outside of the new construction. Uh, currently, our law center is located here on the bottom, bottom corner of the screen of the block. That would be removed, and, and the cost of removing that structure is included in the price uh, that we've, we're running the bond for. And so that would be our new parking lot space. We are able to retain the same number of parking spots that we currently have in our parking uh, at our current facility. And so we're, we're also able to effectively add some green space and, and some, some, uh, some other enhancements like locating the uh, handicapped parking a little bit more closer to the entrance as well. <clears throat> Before you switch away, could you go back to the, the first floor plan? I thought of one other thing I wanted to mention. Um, our current jail has 44 beds available, and many times we're over population. We have to outsource and house people in other counties, as has been mentioned. Uh, it's been an ongoing pro pro problem for us historically. Uh, the new construction is being designed to build for 96 beds. And so we asked our architect to explain to us why they identified that 96 bed capacity. Uh, what they look at is data that's collected throughout the state from all the counties based on their incarceration rates. And so if we apply the average of the state incarceration rates to our population in Clinton County, that actually tells us we need to build for 112 beds. Uh, we, we have the space already planned for that we would be able to add that additional 16 beds into the current proposed construction without any remodeling at all that would get us to that 112 capacity. And then also, for the long-term future, the roof of the single-story construction above the processing area is being built to a standard that it would be able to support an additional floor added on with approximately 30 more cells being able to be included for additional growth of our facility to meet our long-term needs. Um, there's been some questions about working to avoid the, the challenges that we currently have from plumbing leaks and, and those types of problems. Um, we feel we would effectively be able to do so because all of those services will be run through the walls around the perimeter as opposed through as opposed to being run through the floor like they are in our current facility. And then also, uh, when, you, when you identify that you have a problem like that, you can design around them. And so we can work to avoid those. Now that we know that those problems exist, we're gonna be able to be planful and mindful of those things and avoid them for the future. A few more uh, architectural highlights that I wanted to draw attention to. If you're familiar with our, our courthouse throughout around the building has some arched windows. And we talked about whether or not we wanted to draw arched windows in to help the two facilities mesh and blend together. Our architect discussed with us that arched windows and new construction are incredibly expensive. And so the way that we avoid that additional expense is to do a little bit of brickwork around the top of the uh, windows to give the eye that impression. And there again, it's, it's a feature that works to have the whole facility be uh, attractive and work together. 